Welcome back. Off the Record starts right now. On the OTR panel this week, we have Kathy Barks Hoffman and Bill Ballinger, along with Zach Gorchow. Here's the OTR rundown. Former Congressman McCotter's stunning decision. Petition signatures filed with the state regarding ballot proposals and lawmakers prepared to return. Later on, congressional write-in candidate Nancy Cassis will be here. All this and more coming up right now, off the record. Getting the inside out, it's Off the Record with senior Capitol correspondent Tim Skubik and his Capitol Press Corps colleagues. Production of Off the Record is made possible in part by a grant from Truscott Rossman, Michigan's only bipartisan strategic communications firm, serving statewide, national, and international clients from their offices in Lansing, Detroit, and Grand Rapids. TruscottRossman.com By the Michigan Food and Beverage Association, in conjunction with the Michigan Business and Professional Association, working together for its members. Membership information on the web at mishbusiness.org. And by Hager Fox Heating and Air Conditioning Company, providing comfort to mid-Michigan homes and businesses since 1941. Hager Fox and Bryant, for whatever it takes. On the web at hagerfox.com. And now this edition of Off the Record with Tim Skubik. Thanks, Joe Donovan. Welcome to this busy week's edition of Off the Record. Thanks to Thaddeus McCotter. Quiet summer up until now. What happened to him? Well, he decided not to run. He stepped down, and uh, that created a huge need for a special election, apparently. I don't think that Governor Snyder really wanted to have one. It's going to cost at least $650,000. Uh, the local governments are screaming about the cost. They're hoping the state picks it up. Um, and meanwhile, you've got uh, no Democrats running in the special election to fill the last two months of his seat. Uh, you do have two Republicans running at the moment. Uh, but it's really con convoluted because first you have the August primary to fill the next two-year term. Don't even then try you to go to September. Us, Kathy. <laughs> I hear there they go for the dial. Yeah. <laughs> then you go to September for the special <laughs> primary, and then you go on November 6th. Then pe some people will be voting on both of those races. Yeah. For so. those of you that are still left, why did he decide to bail out? Uh, because of that video, the movie that he made after he dropped. Wasn't that his the president. final straw? I mean, that wasn't the, movie, the reason. Well, the movie, the embarrassment by McCotter of McCotter over the, the making of the movie and all the publicity about it, that was what finally pushed him the, over the There edge. was a script. Yeah. It wasn't a movie. Whatever okay. it was, <laughs> it got major embarrassing publicity. Well, what was embarrassing about And it? you had to guess that something more was probably going to be coming, and it was the latest bit of So pounding. he needed a close for the movie, so he decides to... I think he decided, enough already, I just don't want any more of this, and I quit. And it was an expensive decision and a, a very selfish decision on his part. He said he'd had a nightmarish month and a half. I would submit that it probably went a little longer than that. <laughs> Huh? You just you just scratch your head looking at this. I mean, this is just a remarkable personal meltdown uh, by Thaddeus McCotter, and with terrible consequences. You know, the local governments are going to be out six hundred fifty thousand dollars, and you know, the, yeah, the script was uh, reported by the the Detroit News that he had written apparently during his uh, last year or two in office, um, in which it basically chronicled a fictional congressman whose career melted down. Boy, who does that sound like? <laughs> Apparently, uh, it was easy to write. There was a lot of off-color <laughs> topics, you know, uh, body language. It was just embarrassing. I mean, just just awful. And uh, you know, he quit the next day. It appeared. It certainly appeared. You know, the news didn't say where they where they got the script from, but it sure looked like somebody close to him uh, leaked it. And that must have been. You know, I, I'm not going to pretend to get inside his head, but all you can think is it was more than he could he could continue to stomach. Well, he's not completely off the hook here. There is still the attorney general uh, investigation into the signatures that were turned in and, and why over a thousand of them appeared false. Um, you know, there, there there could be an issue of whether you know he was afraid there was going to be more coming out of that that could leave him personal personally responsible and, um, you know, maybe decide to get ahead of the game. I don't know. I mean, like you said, it's all speculation. Who knows what he's thinking. He's disappeared. 
He hasn't talked to anybody, well, has he? he should have disappeared into the bowels of Congress for five months and just kept his head down, his mouth shut, and cast votes and done nothing more and saved the taxpayers 650000 Instead, he quit and created this mess. Well, the irony is, had he made the decision two weeks prior to last Friday night, right. okay, right. there would have been no additional cost at all. So I assume that he did not look into the cost implications of this decision, which does make it a little self-serving. But this is a guy who ran as a fiscal conservative. Okay, those credentials are certainly blown to smithereens. I just think he just completely fell apart in every way you can, you can fall apart. I mean, I just think he was not thinking of anything but himself, the consequences. He just couldn't go on and uh, you know the the you know whether you know his past fiscal conservatism you know that was just all out the window he was only thinking about himself Tim, at that point. Tim, uh, this gets complicated so I won't go long and we can get into this with our guest today but there's still a way that the taxpayers could be saved. The Explain it. Okay. Thousand. Well two people Nancy Cassis our guest today the write-in candidate and Kerry Benavilio who's on the ballot in the Republican primary for the regular seat on August 7th they have said they are going to run in a special election on September 5th but the day after the primary they could decide both of them were off the ballot and the governor has said if only one person runs or nobody runs for this uh, files for this special election we're going to cancel well, it. Wait a minute. They ha one of them has to drop out before the election. Well, again, think of the sequence here. July 20th is the filing deadline. Correct. Okay, so they file, say we're running in the special. August 7th comes along about two weeks later. One of them wins, one of them loses, and they each decide, let's just get out of the special election. They withdraw. Right. And now, if nobody else has filed, remember, it's a free country. Right. Somebody else could have filed right. by July 20th. And if they don't agree to get out, but if they, at that point, get out, you could cancel that prime. The governor said, we will cancel the election mm -hmm. if there's nobody filing or only one person. We'll it, cancel. It, it seems like an if come. I mean, you're, you're basically saying, okay, yeah, Carrie Benavolio and Nancy Cassis, you know, don't run, spare the cost of the special election. It's not worth it. But like Bill said, someone else could, I mean, they could look at this and say, wow. There's I could an be a member of Con all yeah. I have to do is gather a thousand sure. petition signatures. Yeah. I could be a member of Congress for yeah. for right. for seven, seven weeks. weeks. Yep. You so can, I, I don't you know. Can I think say I was a that scenario right. where you would you know, retirement and all sorts yeah. of stuff. Yeah. That scenario where you urge people not to run, it's so pretty shaky. I think. All right. Petitions were filed this week on a myriad of issues. We now are going to have seven. Is that the magic number? Yes. Uh, we had the two thirds people check in this week. We had the uh, casinos. We had who else? Uh, Adult workers. Yeah. Twenty five yeah. by twenty five. Yeah. The the interesting thing that emerges this week is that the, the Chamber of Commerce and others are looking at an interesting strategy. Just, just vote no on everything. You know, it's mm -hmm. not a bad idea if you want to kill this stuff. Well, I think it, it's at least the least expensive option going forward. You know, you don't, it's, it would be very expensive to fight all those issues. And um, so I think, you know, there really aren't any, I think, that they feel strongly that they would want. So it, it is much easier to just say, say no to all of them and see if they can get that done. The one that they might want is a two-thirds majority I, vote. I, I, I you know what, I'm not so sure the chamber's so. on board no. with well, that. Well, I don't they think haven't they, made a decision. They, well, but they want road funding. I and agree. You right. Precisely. That road kills road the Snyder yeah, technology. They're, they're willing to throw that under the bus for all the others, I think. It, it, it's a really smart strategy. This has been brewing for a while where they could see it was looking like a lot of these were going to end up on the ballot. And usually you'd have seven different committees formed in opposition to each one. And to try to fight each of these one-on-one -on -one is going to be awfully hard to raise all the money for each one. But if you have one committee, which there is one called Citizens Protecting Michigan's Constitution, it sort of serves as an omnibus committee for all of them. Suddenly you consolidate your fundraising, you consolidate your message, you just say a simple message, you know, all these special interests are trying to mess up the Constitution. It becomes a lot simpler. Now the one problem is you do have the referendum on the emergency manager law, right. which if it does make the ballot, most of these entities would like to see that pass, and that means they want a yes vote. So that is the one complication, but this coalition has formed, and it's getting to work. And it's a lot going. of that may depend on the numbers that are assigned to the issues. For example, if the EM thing is number seven, you could simply say vote no on one through six. But well, if it's stuck in the middle at number well, it's, four, it'll, it'll, if, it's, if it makes the battle, it'll be number one. It was the first one. That, well, that, okay, first all right, one, yeah. so, yeah. yeah. Well, well, that's right. I'm sorry, you're right. Vote, vote no on two through seven. 
They I don't come up with something. I don't know about that. Well, they do have, you know, the, the easy to make uh, argument that these things might be perfectly good, you know, having a higher requirement for renewable energy and things, but they should not be a requirement in the state constitution. I think that's going to resonate with a lot of independent voters who may not feel, you know, as strongly one way or the other. And so that might be the best strategy that they can have anyway, is that these are, you know, there's other ways to do this by statute. They don't need to be messing up the state constitution. Plus, if you're talking about messaging, which this is all about, vote no is not even a 10 second sound bite, mm -hmm. okay? The other side has to explain what all right. 25, 25 is and the people's eyes glaze over. All right, I want, before we um, call in our guest, I want to say a little bit about Tom Green who passed last week. Uh, Tom uh, used to sit around this table um, <laughs> and was an interesting <laughs> dude, wasn't he? Yes, he was, <laughs> absolutely. Um, what, what's his legacy? I think he gave Turkey a great currency uh, in the capital. That's Explain to people the way what that means. he referred to just about everybody in elective office. Uh, these turkeys did this, and et cetera, et cetera. He was bombastic, larger than life, nearly 300 pounds, handlebar yep. mustache, uh, great uh, personality, ratings booster, Tim. Absolutely. He, and created, he, he created an audience for this program. There you go. He did. Yeah. And uh, so he's been missed for a long, long time, but yeah. at least we knew he was alive, and unfortunately. He, uh, he, he cut a wide path. I, I described him, he was Mike Wallace before there was a Mike Wallace. Uh, people <laughs> either feared him. Uh, and he came into the Capitol Press Corps at a time that the pencil pushers, with all due respect to the newspaper guys and ladies, uh, the television had not established itself in the Capitol as a, but you know what, you right. show up with a microphone and a camera, where a politician's going to go. Right, right, right to the camera, except when Tom came, they ran in the other direction yeah. after a while. Right, they we realized a, it was We have a short clip interest. of Tommy on the show. This is, goes back to 1972. We're discussing on the show at that time Lieutenant Governor Jim Brickley and what he's up to in the future. Here's Tommy. Really? Yeah. He seems to be throwing out some feelers, though, to... I think, oh, sure, he know, wants to, to be a federal judge or something like that, but I think he wants to be governor. I don't think he ever went for that number two spot because what he always wanted to be number general? two. No. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he, well, he was absolutely right. And uh, I, I apologize for the other guy who was on that show. <laughs> uh, what do you remember about Tommy? Oh, just, you know, his big personality. And, you know, the fact that even though he was a really tough and good investigative reporter, he just still had a big, big heart, you know. I mean, he was a he, pussycat. He yeah, really was. Yeah, yeah. But he, you know, he was a guy who stuck up for the little guy, you know, and, um, and just didn't accept a lot of the baloney floating around the Capitol and, you know, dug into things, which is what good journalists do. Uh, he had, had a problem with Paula Blanchard. Uh, yeah, remember he that? got crosswise with the Blanchard administration, and in a sense, he feels it really cost him his capital beat. And uh, he, he actually had a very conservative side on social cultural issues. He ended up running for the legislature yes. as a Republican, right. which a lot of people were surprised at. He didn't win the primary. Well, it was and one then, of those situations where he thought his name ID vis-a-vis -vis the two would translate into votes, and he had a weird awakening. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes it, and the good Lord may have been watching out for him. Shows you what those primary turnouts are like, Tim. Who exactly. Votes? Well, our, our, our condolences go to Dottie and the six kids and the 26 grandkids. Uh, he was just, he was a great friend and a great correspondent, and Tommy, we will miss you. All right, let's call in the senator. Senator, please. A former school psychologist turned politician, Nancy Cassis served in the Michigan Senate and House and is now a write-in candidate as a Republican candidate for the congressional district in and around Livonia, which of course was left vacant by Mr. Cotter's departure. She holds degrees from Ohio University and the U of M and served on the Senate Taxation Committee during her Senate tenure. Senator, good to see you again. Happy summer to you. I'm sure you're having an interesting time and Zach will look into that right now. <laughs> Well, Senator, a lot of Tea Party people are, are not happy that you decided to run, that they felt like Kerry Benavolio had gone out and gotten the signatures, got himself on the ballot, then the whole Thaddeus McCotter situation happens. Um, you decide to run as a write-in with the support of a lot of major party leaders in Oakland County. How is it not a slap in the face to the Tea Party that you got into this race? Well, let me tell you, I think long before there was a Tea Party as such, I was espousing the policies and the goals of the Tea Party. So my record was very conservative, principled conservative. Um, I think that in all of this, what we're looking at is a choice, a choice between two individuals, someone like myself who has had a great deal of experience, is highly qualified to run. 
I don't need uh, on the job training to go to Congress. And uh, my opponent and his campaign, uh, I'd like to say at this point in time, seems pretty irresponsible and foolish in some of the things that they have done. But the, the voters ultimately will decide the outcome. And of course, we're, we're very cognizant of the fact that right, doing a write-in campaign is an uphill uh, battle, if you will. But we are really engaged in it. And I want to just show you very briefly what we're doing. First of all, you've got to show the um, voters why to vote for me. And then you have to show them how. So this is a sample ballot on actually how you would write in my name. And be sure to fill in that little bubble so that it counts. Senator, your chances of winning this thing are pretty remote, aren't they? I don't think so. I'll tell you why. I represented about one-third of the district, the new district, in the state Senate. So there is a good chance that I have good, solid name recognition, number one. Number two, uh, we're doing this in a very strategic type of plan to educate the public that this is a write-in and why you should write in and how to do it. Um, we're meeting with people all over. We've sent out brochures to the absentee voters. I think we're doing this very smart and wise. Pretty irresponsible and foolish, you said a couple of minutes ago. What, yes. what specifics? Well, I think there's a big difference here uh, in contrast between myself and my opponent. First and foremost on foreign policy and where he stands on uh, defense of this country. He would repeal the Patriots Act that has kept us safe since 9-11. He also would remove uh, the border patrols, uh, creating a situation of some vulnerability of allowing people illegally to come into the country, bring in potentially uh, drugs, smuggle them in, or guns. I think that's irresponsible. And importantly, he has said publicly he would call for the removal of all our troops overseas from our military bases. Now, I think it is very critical to keep the United States safe and secure. Before I throw this to Kathy, let me indicate that we did invite your opponent to be here. We never got a phone call back. Ms. Hoffman. Um, you know, what do you think the likelihood, if you do lose the primary, that a Democrat might win that seat? I mean, I've talked to Republicans in the district who say, well, I'm not going to vote for a Tea Party candidate. So. Well, uh, needless to say, this whole fiasco, if you will, and what's happened in the 11th Congressional District has not only had reverberations here in Michigan, but all the way nationally. Uh, this is a very much looked at election. It's being watched. Uh, I think uh, Democrats, certainly, if they thought they could have a chance uh, at uh, if uh, the person who uh, wins a primary is an unknown, like my uh, opponent, um, then they might have a leg up. Uh, I would give them uh, the uh, opportunity, I'm sure, here to make hay out of this whole situation. But if I do win this election, and we are really committed to winning this <coughs> election, then I think we can go toe to toe with any Democrat and, and win it. You know, it's a 55% Republican district. If, if Kerry Benavidio wins the Republican primary, will you endorse him? I will, in, uh, I, that's a very good question. Um, I, let me think about that. You quite just frankly. did. You wanted to <laughs> say no. Let me, you know, I think. You hadn't thought about this before? I hadn't thought about endorsing because I think I'm going to win. Okay, but his question is valid. If you had yes. to answer it today, you wouldn't endorse him. You just uh, called him irresponsible and foolish. Uh, I did. I did. So I think I would wait on any endorsement. Okay, one uh, question is the governor has called a special election, as you know, uh, on September 5th uh, primary right. and November 6th concomitantly with a regular <coughs> election for the unexpired portion of the Thaddeus McCotter term. Uh, you have indicated you are going to run in that special election, and I guess Mr. Benavilio has too. 
Uh, what would happen if uh, one or the other, and one of you will lose, I hate to say it, the uh, primary on uh, August 7th, would you withdraw from that election on September 5th? Because the governor has said mm -hmm. if only one candidate or no candidates run in that special or file, uh, we'll cancel the election, save the taxpayers 650000 Absolutely. And the reason is, just as you said it, I'm a fiscal conservative. And to put through the taxpayers of the state to have a bill come out that would be $650,000, it's ridiculous on the face of it. Well, then the only reason you said you're going to run it is because you knew that Benavilio was going to run. You didn't want to have him say, I'm running, you know, and you're saying, I'm not even serious, I'm not going to run? Uh, I would say that's correct. I am a serious candidate. Importantly, too, we did not learn about this um, opportunity that if there is n only one candidate or no candidates, right. that it would be canceled. Uh, right. That was made significantly after some right. decisions had been made to at least start collecting sure. signatures on petitions. Should Mr. McCotter get out his checkbook? Huh, that's a great question. I think what he decided he would do would be giving, giving it over to charity, uh, St. Jude's, but I think there's a lot of people who say, no, step up now, and if this special election goes forward, you have a certain responsibility here. So you think he should kick in for part of the cost? Yes. There was a lot of, uh, you know, talk about other people that might run as the write-in candidate against Mr. Benavolio. Um, and the Republican, uh, you know, a lot of the top folks, uh, Republican officials settled on you. Um, was that mostly because you said you'd go ahead and kick in at least $200,000 of your own money to the race? I think there were a number of factors. Number one, that I would make a very strong commitment, which I have. Those are my savings, my life savings, quite frankly. But importantly, too, they knew that I had name recognition, having served in the legislature for 14 years with some distinction and leadership. Um, there was also the name recognition factor. They know I'm a darn good campaigner. I work very, very hard. And so those strengths all came together in their decision making. You There's showed that card of how people are supposed to vote for you. Is that being mailed to every identifiable, likely Republican voter in the primary, all the absentee people? How are you getting that message out? Absolutely. That was the first course of business. We sent out over 17,000 of these uh, initial brochures, and there was a follow-up and now I believe there's a third one going to the full domain as well. We know that getting your message out through these type of flyers are very successful, but we're also uh, hitting the airwaves with our message as well. Um, we're doing, as I said, a very strategic plan. Now, you, the one question you haven't asked, so I'll, I'll uh, <coughs> mention it, uh, I think you'll enjoy this, you know, how many times has a write-in candidate for Congress ever been successful? And uh, I did ask that question, and one person volunteered three times. Well, we hope to make it four. Three in this state or nationally? No, nationally. Okay. So we hope to make it four and make history in Michigan. There's been some speculation that, uh, that some of the some or all of the $200,000 that you had put up at the beginning of this was a result of the time you spent as a consultant for the Maroon family, owners of the Ambassador Bridge, of course, fighting the proposed new bridge. Could you address that? Did, did they provide any assistance financially to uh, your campaign? No, nothing f toward my campaign. And uh, to set the record straight, in my working as a consultant for the bridge company, it was because of my philosophical conservative belief that the private sector can do almost anything uh, better faster and more efficient than government. So the governor's wrong on this one. The governor's wrong on this. You know, governor and myself, we're all part of the same family, but as you know, even within a family, sometimes you have certain disagreements. Well, so the governor is wrong. I'm not going to say he's wrong. I just well, is think he right? I, I, I think he's <laughs> premature. Premature? He's premature in his going ahead with a um, bridge uh, that could be built privately already by the uh, Detroit International Bridge Company. They've offered to do it. It's on the record that they would. Were the ads that Mr. Maroon ran, were they truthful? As far as I know, they were. 
Uh, you take certain liberties probably in any uh, campaign, but on the whole, yes, they were. Certainly the issue about traffic not being there to justify How a new How about the bridge. issue of the $100 million? You know, I think uh, if you really believe, I think like the Maroon family does, that uh, their support of the American dream and the ability to uh, for private enterprise to go forward and move on projects is the way to go, and I personally believe that. A and the governor even, you know, talked about economic gardening. Grow it right here. Use the resources of private enterprise to uh, move forward. So obviously overall, I think they're doing this out of sincere conservative principles. Are you that, having that, any don't you have the argument, though, that the bridge is going to be built by a private company? I mean, the government's not going to build that bridge. You're going to have a private company come in and, and do bids to build the bridge. So, I mean, does that hold water with you, or do you think Kathy, that's not Kathy, I right? don't think that uh, lets uh, the taxpayers of this state off. You believe they're going to be on the I, I do. Look at the uh, Mackinac Bridge. They said okay, someday that's going to be free. It's not. Senator, we got to get out of here. Thanks for joining us on our program. We appreciate it. It's good to see you again. Also, thanks to Zach and to Kathy and to Bill. Don't forget, we are on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. See you next week right here on Off the Record. Production of Off the Record is made possible in part by a grant from Truscott Rossman, Michigan's only bipartisan strategic communications firm serving statewide, national, and international clients from their offices in Lansing, Detroit, and Grand Rapids. TruscottRossman.com By the Michigan Food and Beverage Association, in conjunction with the Michigan Business and Professional Association, working together for its members. Membership information on the web at mishbusiness.org. And by Hager Fox Heating and Air Conditioning Company, providing comfort to mid-Michigan homes and businesses since 1941. Hager Fox and Bryant, for whatever it takes, on the web at HagerFox.com. M Live Media Group, providing real-time Michigan news, sports, business, and entertainment at MLive.com. Tim Skubik blogs about Michigan politics daily at MLive.com. Off the Record can be seen online anytime at video.wkar.org. Episodes on DVD are also available for purchase. Michigan Public TV stations have contributed to the production costs of Off the Record with Tim Skubik.